God, thank you, Lord, for your love, and thank you for the opportunity to get together tonight. I pray that, Lord, you just please uh, help the lessons to go according to your will, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to teach and, and to learn. And Lord, uh, we enter into this study deliberately, <coughs> knowing who we are studying. God, we love you and we praise you, and uh, just please help us now as we look at these things. In your name I pray. Amen. Uh, again, with Institute... Um, Take notes, uh, we'll look at things. Um, if you ever have questions, raise your hand, all right? Anybody asks a question, uh, we'll do our best to answer it. Uh, you know, a little, a lot less formal than a church service, and it's an opportunity to, to talk about things and uh, to, I can't guarantee I'll have an answer, but I can't guarantee I'll try my best to answer, and if I don't know the answer, I will study it. And if I still can't get an answer, I'll be honest and tell you I can't. Uh, but, I will do my best. So that's all. Turn to Genesis chapter number one to get started. Genesis chapter number one, good place to start when we're studying God. Genesis Amen. chapter number one, and we'll look at this together. All right, we we are covering what's called theology. The official name is proper theology because theology kind of covers everything. It's very broad, but proper theology or theology proper is the study of God Himself. All right. And, um, and so, um, we're going to do our best to, to look at what the Bible says about God and how we come to these um, thoughts on who God is. This uh, quote up here is from our church webpage. Uh, this is our article of faith about God. And, um, and it says this, we believe and teach that there is one God um, and only one God true and living God. He is absolute in nature, perfect in attributes, holy in character. He is the creator of all things, animate and inanimate. He is immutable, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, and sovereign. Um, quick definition of these words, all right? Um, Creator of all things, animate and inanimate. Um, again, from us to a tree, uh, to you know a rock, uh, he is the creator of all. Immutable means what? Never changes. Omnipresent um, means everywhere. He's everywhere. Uh, omnipotent means all powerful. All powerful. Omniscient means all knowing. All knowing. Eternal means. Without beginning. No beginning or ending. And sovereign means in complete control. He's in complete control. Yep. All right. Then there's scriptures. Just a that's just what's on our website. Obviously, we're going to look at a lot of different scriptures throughout these three weeks. Uh, but God, um, who He is, um, God. And the good thing is this: God wants us to know who He is. Yeah. That that is one of the big blessings. Is that God is not some impersonal being out there that doesn't want us to get to know Him. God desires for us to learn Him. All right, this, the concept of God. All right, the concept of God. Genesis 1.1 reads, let's look at that real quick. It says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. He created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God. The Bible begins with the presupposition that God <laughs> exists. All right? And nowhere in the Bible does it, you know, try to offer arguments for his existence. Alright? It just starts with this statement, in the beginning, God. He's already there. He's already been there. And it just starts with the, the knowledge that God exists. Uh, it doesn't try to explain, you know, you know, where God's been for all of eternity or what he has done. Or uh, It just begins with this statement, in the beginning, God. Um, a, the study of God himself, again, is called proper theology. A proper study of theology begins with two assumptions. The first assu assumption that it begins with is that God exists. Or always has, always will. God exists. Um, he would cease to be God if someone made him. Right? Yeah. Um, he's always been. <laughs> It, assumes with this, it starts with this assumption that God exists, and number two, that God has revealed himself to man. That God has revealed himself to man. Not only does he exist, but he, he has shown himself to us. He has revealed himself to us. 
Um, I, I enjoyed this. Theology may seem intimidating, but anytime we form an opinion about God or make an assertion about Him or look to Him for anything, we are in essence doing theology. Whether we praise Him, curse Him, pray to Him, or deny Him, we're acting on our theology. Again, I hope none of us in this room, you know, curse Him and do those other things. But even people out there in the world, right, when they use God's name in vain, they are practicing theology. They're saying what they believe about God. They believe that they have the ability to curse God, which they don't, right? Uh, but they're revealing their faith. Um, every time we bow our head and we pray and we ask God for something, every time we, we praise Him for His blessings, uh, when the lost world denies His existence, they're acting on theology. They're sharing what they believe about God. God does exist, and He has revealed Himself to us. First thing we want to talk about tonight is the, lo the logic the logic of, the, of a concept of God. Now this is kind of something you got to think about. Kind of stay with me here, right? Uh, and, I, and I'll try, and again, any questions, I'll try to answer those. Just slip your hand up, all right, at any time. And even if I'm talking, I'll finish my sentence and get back to your question, all right? But the logic of a concept of God, the fact of the existence of God, and you got to remember this because we'll refer to this uh, throughout the next three weeks. But the fact of the existence of God is called the first truth. Alright? The first truth. And it's called that because a first truth is a knowledge that is intuitive. It's not derived from observation because none of you have ever seen God. None of us. It's not de derived from observation um, or... Someone wrote about it, and, you know, all of a sudden, that's uh, how your, you, your God was created by someone who wrote about it. That's not a real God. Uh, or even reflection. Intuition may be defined as knowing something without having to be told. Now, I'm going to build on this, and I'll probably go ahead of my notes, and then we'll just get back to it. The concept of God is something that God created every man with. Mm -hmm. That's why the Bible starts with, in the beginning, God. No background, no proof text that there is a God. It's just with the assumption He's God. And God created all of us with this first truth. I don't care who you are, and I'll say this again later, I don't care where you live on this earth, something inside of every man knows there's a God. Mm -hmm. It's a universal thing. No matter where you go on this earth, no matter where you travel, you may go somewhere, I don't, it'd be hard-pressed in this age to do so, but if you could find somewhere where no man has ever had any sort of contact with them before, they will have a form of God. Probably way messed up, but they're going to have a form of God. Because something inside of them knows it. Uh, that's why you travel to, you know, back in times past, we're going on a time, time travel here, you go to Egypt, and they have their gods. Yeah. You go to Babylon, they have their gods. You go to the Phoenicians, they have their gods. You go to the Greeks, they have their gods. You go to the Romans, you have their gods. You go down the middle of Africa, where no one's been for a thousand years, and they have their gods. When they discovered North America, and then the Native Americans, they had their gods. No matter where you go, no matter what time frame you want to go to, because God created man with this knowledge in him, it's called the first truth. We know there's a God. Uh, our belief in God is intuitive. It exists in all men, whether admitted or not. You say, well, I know people that say there is no God. Absolutely. There's lots of people that say that. But the Bible talks about that when it says the fool has said what? In his heart, there is no God. And, and that's really important because before they would ever say it with their mouth, <clears throat> they first have to convince their own heart. Because <clears throat> their own heart says otherwise. Their own heart cries out that there's a God. Mm. Um, and, but they first, a fool has to first state, say to himself, no. Because their heart says otherwise. Um, whether it's admitted or not, and would exist even if it were possible from birth to allow the mind to develop apart from the senses. The knowledge of God is the unique feature of man. We are a spiritual being. 
We possess a God consciousness. Um, this is what distinguishes man from all other creation. Mm -hmm. um, I got a dog. The dog has a conscience. Animals are created with that, right? Um, my dog knows when he does bad, right? Uh, they, ha they, they can discern that, right? Uh, they, my dog has a will. Sometimes I tell my dog to go in his house. He just looks at me because he doesn't want to go to his house, right? <laughs> he has a will. Uh, he has a conscience. He can think. He feels guilt. Uh, he's happy. When I get home tonight, he's going to be very happy, right? He has all these emotions, but he has no conscience of God. Mm -hmm. Zero. Right? He, he has, you know, and don't misunderstand me. I know in the Bible, all of creation obeys the Lord, right? But my dog does not sit around and think about God. That's where man is different than all creatures, right? God has separated us that, that we have this first truth, this intuitive knowledge that I have that I have a creator. Um, this, this knowledge, three things, first of all, it's universal. Uh, it's because all men manifest a belief in some God. It's universal. Now there is a this, you know, a new push that there is no God, and you know, it's not there's nothing new, it's repeated every century. Uh, but it, they call them atheists today, and we'll talk about it later, right? Uh, but, you know, they, all they're doing is denying what they know is true. Every man knows it. Uh, but the, it's universal. I don't care what, again, time frame, geographic location you want to go to, it's there in every man. Secondly, it's necessary. Now, it's universal because all men manifest a belief in some God, but it's necessary because the mind of man is compelled by its very nature to a recognition of God. The mind, by its nature, we know there's a God. Mm -hmm. And you have to deny your own thoughts. That's what Romans talks about, which we'll get to in just a second, that nature screams that there's a God. And the heart and knowledge of man recognizes it. Uh, it's, it's, it's prime because such knowledge cannot be broken down into other basic forms or does not need to be proved by other facts. Prime means there's nothing else like it, right? That's why in the Transformers, Optimus Prime, he was the best, right? Uh, no one was like him. Um, it helps me understand, right? So, uh, but uh, it's a prime knowledge, in the, 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 not the concept of God, because, again, there's nothing that's going to teach us how there's a God or, you know, where he came from or these things. There's, again, the Bible, you're looking at the words, in the beginning, God. There he is. And that's where the Bible starts, and that's in our hearts. It's where it starts. We know there's a God. And it um, doesn't need to be proved by other facts. You know, if you came in this room, which none of you did, but if you came in this room trying to be convinced that there's a God, all right, I will give you Bible, I'll give you things to think about, but the fact is this, you already know in your heart there's a God. Because God created all of us in that way. Even if there was no Bible, we would know there's a God. Even people who've never opened up a Bible know that there's a God. Here's these verses, look at them real quick with me in Romans chapter number 1. In Romans chapter 1, <coughs> verse number 19. Romans 1 and in verse number 19. Romans 1.19 says, Because that which may be known of God, Romans 1.19, because that which may be known of God, so I'm just letting that sink in, that which may be known of God, that's what we're here to do is study God, right? That which may be known of God is manifest where? In them. For God hath what? Showed, Showed it unto them. That knowledge is in us. It's in every man. God placed it there. And then he's given us things that support that in our heart. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Just, you can, the Bible amazes me. Just the vocabulary in the first part of that verse. I mean, man can't write these things. The depth of what you're reading. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, and even his eternal power and Godhead, 
so that they are without what? Excuse. No man has an excuse because God created all of us. And John 1 talks about that, that this light has shone upon all men. God made us with this first truth, with this intuitive knowledge, there is a God. And then, just in case he wants to try to tell his heart there is no God, he has to walk outside and see creation and have to deal with that. And that's why evolution is one of the most damnable heresies that has ever come in modern age. It's sending so many people towards a destructive end because it denies what the Bible says God left for us to confirm in our hearts the concept of God. Mm -hmm. And what a lie that everything happened by an explosion or everything happened by chance or everything happened by accident. No, sci it, no scientist can reproduce anything what they teach there. I mean, you, you can't even experiment that way. No one's ever been able to blow up things and all of a sudden it came out perfect, right? It, you can't. All right? These invisible things, these knowledge, supports the first truth within our heart uh, so that no man is without excuse. Over to the right in Hebrews chapter number 11. In Hebrews chapter number 11. And in verse number 6. Hebrews 11 and in verse number 6. And for those guys doing the training part, and we'll take the quiz next week. Uh, this is your memory verse. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He what? He is. And that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. You just have to believe that He is. See, God created all of us with this knowledge. And... I have down there, I don't know if you can see that very well, apologize, I, but I have a, 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 a link, right? If you want to jot it down, go to strangenotions.com, if you're into this, backslash do, hyphen, atheist, hyphen, believe, hyphen, in, hyphen, God, hyphen, after, hyphen, all. all right? Now, why did I put that on there? It's an interesting thing, if you're ever interested in this stuff, read it, right? But someone in the Netherlands did was doing just a research on human responses, and uh, in a nutshell, here's what it is, right? They, they hooked up everyone to these lie detector machines, and, and I heard a story when I was like growing up about this truck company, that, you know, I don't know if it's true or not, I couldn't find it anymore. Uh, but this just happened, and, um, and what they did, these people in the Netherlands, they were testing human reaction to lies. And it's just interesting because they, didn't, they did not set out in this study to do anything with Christianity. Right? That was not their goal. They weren't looking to prove a Christian point. All right? uh, they were just studying human reaction. And uh, they, they hooked all these people up to all these things to, that judges your heart rate, um, you know, blood pressure, even what you're, how you're sweating. And, and then they made them say statements like this. They said, uh, say this statement, I wish my parents were in a car wreck and were paralyzed. Now, no, no one wants that. Right? But they made them say it. And they did. But then to add a little something to it, they said, the, ne the next statement was, say this, that I wish God would cause my parents to be paralyzed. And um, <coughs> they're everyone that claim to be an atheist they began, their heart began to be faster, they perspired more, it went off the chart on these people are lying. Mm -hmm. It's just an interesting article that you read it. And so they asked several questions like that, 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 you know, I wish this would happen, something you wouldn't want anything to happen like, but then say, I wish God would, and the same thing. And every time, those that had no belief in God, they just, it just went crazy. Um, because, and anyone who would have been modern, I said, this guy's really lying, right? Even those that said, I don't believe in a God. Because it truly is an intuitive thing that God has put in all of us. There is a God, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it's kind of interesting. You can read it sometime if you'd like to, right? Uh, so let's talk about some false concepts of God, all right? All kinds of false concepts. Belief in the existence of God as a higher power or a supreme being is natural, it's normal, 
However, from this point, man's understanding of God is deviated from truth because of our vain imaginations. Uh, back in Romans, uh, and I can read this too if you want, but in Romans, wait, I'm going, you can probably read it. Romans chapter number one again, uh, we already read in Romans chapter one, verse 19 and 20, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, the invisible things of creation. Then in verse number 21, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So, notice what it says, again, I'm just back in verse 19, God has manifest this in all of us. Alright? And the invisible things of creation, we can see God in it. Then in verse 21, because that when they knew God, every man knows if you leave tonight knowing anything, I want you to remember that. Every man knows there's a God, no matter what they say. They glorified Him not as God. So they make the choice, they first say in their heart, there is no God. And then they refuse to recognize Him. Then their hearts, they're, they're not going to be thankful, they're going to be vain in their imaginations, and their heart's going to be darkened. So what it leads to a, some false concepts of God. All right? Because uh, you, if you're not, if you're going to convince yourself there is no God, something inside of you demands there's a void there. You got to stand somewhere. And so, s some choose this route of atheism. 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 The prefix a or a means without. Theism is belief in God. So an atheist is someone without a belief in God. Okay. Um, that helps you kind of distinct all kinds of words, right? Ah, moral means without any morals. Some people think music is that way, but it's not true. Uh, you know, that's where you go to an amusement park. The word muse means to think, so I'm going somewhere I don't have to think, right? Um, that's where all that words come from. Uh, but here, an atheist is without a belief in God. Uh, again, Psalm 14 and verse number 1, they say in their heart there is no God. Atheism is unnatural. And abnormal because it is a denial of the existence of God. It's, it's in direct contradiction to what your heart knows to be true. It denies what is intuitive in man and manifests itself in, it's, itself in three ways. So people that try to convince themselves that there is no God, and they say this, they're lying to themselves, and they know that. Um, but I don't care, again, keep this in mind, you say, well, they really believe that. It probably... All of us have, unfortunately, probably told a lie enough to where you believed it. Remember, as being kids, you know, I was guilty. I'm sure you were too, right? Uh, you know, you know, you you you, you kind of lose track of reality after you tell yourself a lie over and over again. And atheism will manifest up in three ways. Number one, there's practical atheism. This is where people have chosen to disregard God from their life. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. He doesn't exist. Uh, there's virtual atheism where people have adopted other philosophies which require no belief in God. Our nation is greatly guilty of virtual atheism. That's where evolution comes in. There's no God. Everything happened by this process. Materialism, living for things. Humanism, living for self. Socialism. Um, everyone just take care of each other. We don't, there's no recognition of God. And um, I was thankful today. I told some folks right before we started, I was asked to go open a prayer this morning at the Claremont County Board of Commissioners. And the reason they stated that they, they always open a prayer is because they want to recognize that we need God. I thought that was fantastic. You know? And... Um, you know, and but society's getting away from that. It's not normal. But this virtual atheism where you, you run to something else that you replace God. A dogmatic atheism are pre people who openly boast about their denial of God's existence. Um, in the past, the philosopher Nietzsche, right? Um, he went around giving lectures on God is dead. And um, he even had it written in the subways 
and after Nietzsche died, someone crossed out God and put Nietzsche is dead. And, uh, mm -hmm. That was kind of cool. But, uh, <laughs> but it's people who just are dogmatic about it, and they almost want to convert other people to be an atheist. But there's atheism, which is just thought of, there is no God. Right? There's agnosticism. Agnosticism, the word comes from A again, without Nosco, I know, without knowledge. An agnostic is someone who says, who knows? Who knows? Well, let me tell you about God. No one can know. I'm an agnostic. Just live life. Leave me alone. Um, I know quite a few agnostics. Um, one that, uh, young lady, she went to school and church. Um, she proudly proclaims that she's an agnostic, um, that you can't know. And um, that's sad. They live with this idea that no one can ever know that there's a God. An agnostic is one who believes it's impossible to ever know the certainty of God. I hope that everyone in this room knows the certainty of God. I hope that you've seen it in your life, your, your prayer life, your, the Word of God's taught you things, you, He's revealed things to you, He's spoken to you, He's guided you, He's led you in your life. But an agnostic says you can't know, and they just kind of want to stick their fingers in their ears and be like, just let me live, let me live, let me live. And they want to live this life to where there's no truths, no absolutes, and I... It's not a term yet, probably don't hear it a lot, but our nation has become very agnostic, right? And um, it will lead towards atheism. And um, like, you go over to other countries, and England is a great example of it. England is, is now primarily atheistic. England just says there is no God, religion's a crutch, you don't need it, just live your life. The step before that was agnosticism, or just who knows, just let us, let, let's not even talk about it and uh, live your life. But one will lead to the other. Another thought on the false concept of God is deism. Deism began in the 1700s during the, in what's known as the Enlightenment period. A deist believes that there's a God, but he's not personal. A deist would be someone, have you ever heard of the term theistic evolution? Where God started it all and kind of let step back and let it evolve. It kind of allows people to believe in evolution and the Bible, which those two can't connect. Uh, but a deist is someone who says, well, right, so God does exist, but he's just out there and you can't really know him. You can't, there's no personal relationship with him. Um, you know, he's just a very impersonal God. We have to be very careful because this false teaching can slip into our churches we, from a lack of a, a devotion life, a prayer life, or living in sin where you're just not able to recipient of the blessings of God like you should be can make you feel so distant from God that people will begin to think of God in this way. They never say they're a deist, but they would begin to think this way. They believe he's an impersonal God. He's present in creation only in his power. He cannot be known in his being. There can be no special revelation. So a deist, take it or leave it. A deist will say, it's just a book, right? Uh, because we learn, God reveals himself through this book, right? This is where we learn of God and draw close to God and hear from God, right? And we get this from this book, but a deist will say, no, he, there is no special revelation, right? God doesn't speak to man. Man's reasoning is sufficient to know that there's a higher being. In other words, man, we, we know, they recognize the first truth, Right? They know that there's a God, but he gave us the ability to think, so let's just figure it out ourselves. It does acknowledge God, right? But it's a very impersonal God. 
it began as the what's called absentee God theory. Kind of like God is an invisible clockmaker who wound up the universe and let it run and man can just do what he wants to do now. In the 1900s, it was the God is dead fed. A deist will place man at the center of the universe. Everything is man. The Freemasons are deist. Right? The Freemasons are not some innocent little club out there, right? There's a lot of rotten stuff that no one should be involved with, the Freemasons, okay? But they're deist. They will refer to God as the divine architect. I hope you can see deism in that, right? God set it all up and said, now, go. Do it. You think, well, glad that didn't affect us. <laughs> it has played a big role in most of our lives in this room, right? Because a lot of people we would greatly respect were deist, right? The concept of, of deism, Leonardo da Vinci was a deist, Thomas Paine, who wrote books like Common Sense, uh, which greatly had an impact on society as a deist. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Benjamin Franklin was a deist. James Monroe was a deist. Mark Twain was a deist, along with many others I could tell you about. They all believed in a higher power, a divine creator. Uh, they, they, they believe in an afterlife, but that you can't really have a personal relationship with God. That there's really no, no need or purpose for prayer. Baptism's foolish. You don't need a church. If you'll stop and think about it, you probably know deists, and they don't even know they're deists. They're the type of people that, oh, I believe in God, why don't you come to church? You don't need church. Hmm. I believe in God, have you ever read your Bible? Uh, not much. But they'll throw in God when it's convenient. Hmm. The deist terms are like, a lot of them are divine providence, divine creator, and then I encourage you sometime to read the Declaration of Independence, and you'll see a lot of deist phrases there. I'm not saying the Declaration's bad, I'm just saying that was the belief system of a lot of those men who had a huge impact in writing that. Did they have a fear in God? Yes. Like Benjamin Franklin, and I don't know the hearts of man, God told me not to judge the hearts of man, is Ben Franklin in heaven or hell? That is not my call, I'm not even going to pretend to tell you. But I am going to tell you he did not believe in having a personal relationship with, with the Lord. Wise man? Absolutely. Did he believe in God? Yes, he did. Uh, and who knows what he heard, right? I Actually, Ben Franklin, his church he attended is still in Boston, still open. And uh, I got kicked out of it. That was awesome. Uh, <laughs> they had all these things. They were doing their uh, LGBT stuff, and they had flags waving everywhere. And they had all these pamphlets for visitors that walked in. So I just got them all and put our tracks up and said, and, uh, they kicked me out of this church. Uh, the only church ever been kicked out. <laughs> um, but uh, they, uh, he was a Jesus, right? So it's just concept. And it, I, you know, like my mind's going through people right now. It just, they, and I'm not saying if they're saved or not. I'm just, everyone's saved and believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all there. But a lot of people are acting on this process, and I believe that there's a lot of people, unfortunately, that are going to be part of that group that says, but Lord, Lord, we, we, we knew your name, we, we did this for you, or whatever, and they, that the Lord's going to say, depart from me. Because we don't go to heaven because we know there's a God, because the fact is this, every man knows that. We go to heaven because we choose to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that he died for our sins and that he rose again and he conquered sin and hell. And having just a belief in God, which a deist does, doesn't mean they're saved. I'm not telling you that every deist isn't saved. I'm just telling you that if that's as far as they're going, they have issues. Right? So that's the deist thought. Right? Um, the study of God, uh, dualism is another. Right? Dualism is another form. It's another concept of God. The dualist believes that there are two distinct principles. That there's good which is God generally, and evil, which is Satan. And that God and Satan are co-eternal. They both are always been, always will be. It is found in a lot of Eastern religions. I have that symbol up there. It always drives me crazy when I see kids giving these symbols and they wear them around their neck or they have them on their 
you know, shirts or whatever the case is. As believers, stay away from that. Mm -hmm. This whole concept, I, is a dualism belief. It's an ancient Eastern religion. And the false teaching is this, all right? And so you, hopefully you'll never forget this, that in all evil, there is some good. And in all good, there is some evil. Hmm. All right? So please don't let your kids play with this stuff. Please don't, as teachers, don't ever pass it out. All right? It is a false, it is a dualist, all right? False teaching. And it's known as the yin yang philosophy. All right? Um, and, uh, and it's totally anti Bible. Because the Bible says that, that Jesus, 1 John, that he is light, and in him no is darkness. no darkness at all. That's right. Hmm. right? And it's totally contradictory to what the Bible teaches here. Uh, but those who believe in this, basically, in all good there's some evil, and all evil there is some good. You have to watch out for this stuff. Um, I'm not a big karate fan, and having kids in karate, I'm all for self-defense and stuff. And I'm not going to judge you if you do that, right? But be careful, because this is in that, right? They'll, they'll teach it, so you've got to be careful. Um, don't just laugh at it when you see it out in the world, right? If you start looking for it, you're going to see it everywhere, right? But uh, it's just false teaching that, in other words, there's no... There's no Righteousness. No, no. I agree with the fact no one's perfect, but God is, right? And we should strive for holiness, and we should strive to be pure. And in order to go to heaven, you must be pure. This is just an acceptance that you know you do your best, try to be as good as you can, but understand. And even those who are just absolutely evil, there's some good in them. Um, Star Wars. <laughs> it's it's there. All right, along with some other things, All right? Uh, but dualism, pantheism, pantheism is the belief uh, that all finite things are divine. Its motto is God, or otherwise nature. God is a tree. God is a rock. God is an animal. Um, all that thought of reincarnation is in this. All nature is God. Mother Earth teaching that's very prevalent today, right? That's pantheism. Basically, pantheism believes that it, it's, it is what the epitome of what Romans 1 talks about. Uh, again, I'm still there, but in verse number 25, just reading under where we read, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Right? Pantheism. Um, a form of pantheism is animism, where objects are worshipped, believing that there's spirits behind them. You'll see a lot of this in uh, the Native Americans and others' religions, right? Uh, polytheistic, in Egypt they had a lot of pantheism. You worship the sun, you worship the, the river, you worship the tree, uh, the spirit of the wind. Sound familiar in your Disney shows? Mm -hmm. The spirit of the wind, the spirit of fire, the spirit of... And that, that these different objects of creation are gods. And we would sit back in our room, and I know today, and we're just like, that's absolutely foolishness. This is being taught in public schools. It's being introduced to them and over and over again in, in, in media and in, in Hollywood and... and um, you know, just, I just saw it on Twitter yesterday, uh, I'm, I'm not an Ellen DeGeneres fan, right? Uh, but they had her on Twitter talking about how the rains and the flooding in California and her plea to the people was we have offended Mother Nature and that we needed to repent for mistreating the environment and this is her judgment upon us. Hmm. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. Hmm. Hmm. You say, well, she wasn't being serious. All of her listeners, it's seeds. Seeds yeah. being planted. And understand what the devil's doing. He's just trying to bring confusion and all these different thoughts. Because what all these things do, everybody look at me, it satisfies that first truth. Mm -hmm. That thing you're born with, that there is a God. 
But then we they the society hears Ellen speaking and they're like, yes, the earth. Yes, the wind and the rain. And then they watch Pocahontas. And yes, the spirit of this and the spirit of that. And then they watch Star Wars and they deal with the force and they deal with all these things. And and eventually we go and speak to them and say, let us tell you about God. I'm good. Because they've come to satisfy in their heart who God is. And it's a total mm -hmm. false concept. So that's why it's really important, especially those that are training for the ministry, when you sit down with someone or you talk to someone out and you're building a relationship with people and they're like, oh, I, I, I'm good, I, I know, I believe in a God. But don't be like, whoa, praise the Lord. And conversation's over. No, you're going to need to dig. Because there's so many false concepts of God that are not just out there, but are being literally ingrained in the heart of our kids and teenagers um, and adults, obviously, but uh, these different thoughts and these false beliefs on God. Pantheism, I want you to just give you some, right? Use the force. That's all the universe around you has this power. It's pantheism. All right? Uh, Avatar, very popular right now. Quote, nature is to be worshipped. All right? Nature is to be worshipped. Even the Lion King, the circle of life. Hmm. It's pantheistic. Even uh, Marvel, what's that guy's name? They, Thor, they, Thanos. Thanos. See, I caught you. Uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanos. Someone said to Thanos, the universe has judged you. That's just there. And in our modern day culture today, God is being replaced with universe. Mm -hmm. Listen for it. Mm -hmm. I really want you to listen for that. All right? Um, either universe or earth. And you listen for it, you're going to be amazed how you're going to pick up on this. Well... But they throw it in as karma, they throw it as other things, but mm -hmm. yep, the universe got you. The universe, Earth knew, you're getting paid back, and they're replacing, God is being replaced by universe and nature. Now, do I think it's a sin to watch Lion King? No. Do I think it's a sin to watch Lion No. But I just want you to know, all right, in your mind, you might want to think, instead of keep shoving everything down people's throats and... You might want to tell them the truth about some things, too, all right? But you need to be careful, okay? Um, I, know, I know it's fiction. But fiction leaves impressions, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so just be careful, because all that is literally the, that is the, the, no pun intended, the force behind these things, right? Mm -hmm. Is to bring this thinking. And that's why you hear these terms, and you're going to hear them more and more, all right? Um, then there's polytheism. Polytheism is the belief in many, or that's where the term po the prefix poly comes from. That means many, uh, many gods. Much of the world's religions, past and present, are polytheistic. The Egyptians were polytheistic. Uh, you had Ra, and um, he's the sun god. And you had the god of the Nile. I used to know it. He's the god of the Nile, um, and uh, the god of. Osiris and all these other false gods, right? Uh, they believe many gods. Um, Romans, obviously, uh, believe in many gods. Neptune, much of our planets. Mars. Um, the Greeks had many gods. Uh, Mount Olympus and all of them. Hinduism has many gods. This is a belief in multiple gods, which will include many of those attributes from those other thinkings that we saw. All right, uh, one present day one is called Hel Helenin. Helenin, all right? Uh, it is a US based religious organization. It's growing, right? They call themselves a church. Uh, dedicated to the revival. I copied this off of their website. All right? That's why it's in white, because it's a direct copy, right? But it's a US based religious organization, church. They even have the church in quotation. I didn't. <laughs> uh, dedicated to the revival and practice of Hellenic poly polytheism. That's the Greek, right? The Olympic gods. We approach 
Hellenic religion from the Reconstructionist perspective, they're trying to rebuild it again, which includes both an emphasis on historical precedent and respect for personal spiritual inspiration. We offer local congregations and study opportunities and fellowship for those who worship the Olympians and the other deities of ancient Greece in a traditional way. They still make sacrifices, not animals, but breads and different fruits and things. Uh, that's their symbol. Uh, they all dress in tunics. <laughs> um, no, don't. I, uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you see, they have a, those are one of those things like, you know, like out there in California, you know, that, that's usually where all those crazy people are. <laughs> Akron. Akron, Ohio is their base. Wow. And um, that's ground zero for Helen, Hellingen, right? I don't even know how to say that. But that's polytheist. And it's still a lot. My only point in putting out there is so not that you will go to Akron, right? My, uh, my point is this. It's still there. Yeah. It's still out there. Right? And, um, and, and this polytheistic view is still causing a lot of problems in people's lives. A belief in many gods. Um, before I go on to true concepts, any <clears throat> thoughts, questions, or anything on that? We just cover a lot of false concepts, but if you do. Dana how, looks like he wants to ask a question. He's not like, yeah. How would you advise, especially given the way society is today and ingrained, how would you advise starting at ground zero with someone, now I believe in God, and not just taking it for granted, but Bringing it out with them instead they of they say don't believe in God. They, they they do believe in God, but it's these other forms. It is um, a biblical pattern, which is building relationships with people. It's a lost art today, but that's how so many people were reached. Just being around people. We always read about all the stories, like with Paul and, and the things that he did. But you understand, he would go to the synagogue. He would be there week after week after week. And eventually they would kick him out. And then he would go down to the river where the people were meeting week after week. And he just built relationships with people. Um, sharing the truth when you have, don't be bold, share it. But people, especially in the United States of America in 2023, were so filled with pride and um, we don't, no one's wrong, that you just sitting down saying, oh, that's not a true belief, let me tell you the true belief. They're going to look at you and say, who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. just, and you have to build a relationship with them. And I'm not saying that sometimes God will just open the door and you'll be able to share something. But usually those are people that have been searching for a while. And, um, but... The biggest thing you're going to be able to do is to build a relationship with people and to continually push them towards this, to, to the truth. Um, because our society has changed even in our generation. <coughs> we used to be able to knock on doors and people want to hear. Because when we were knocking on doors, the adults had all gone to church. Most of them. Their grandmas took them. Now, no one hardly has gone to church. It's just a different generation. The thought of someone living in Milford that never heard of Jesus 50 years ago was laughable. Now it's common. Mm -hmm. They just don't, mm -hmm. they don't know. So, you're going to have to build a relationship to where they want. They're going to trust you to hear what you have to say. I'm not saying not to witness when you see people. I'm just saying that someone has these false beliefs, it's going to take some time, probably. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what they did in the Bible. Because, and in some places, it's going to be very difficult. That's why Paul eventually just left Athens. They were so steeped in their polytheistic beliefs. He, he had to leave. And um, God, will, God would be the only one to tell you to do something like that, to quit trying. To, but you just got to be careful. Chad? I've heard people who are way smarter than I try to reason. Is is it do you ever attempt to reason or just present truth? I just present truth. 
That's all I can do. Now, reason, I, like someone that doesn't believe, their human reasoning usually has taken over. And they're not looking for truth. You can only help people that want to be helped. And if someone is already in their mind and, you know, that's, that's another reason why I never engage on social media with anyone over anything doctrinal. Because if they want to argue something, they're not looking for wisdom. They're not looking for an answer. Right? They're looking to show that they're right. And if they truly want, that's I always offer. Call me. I'll meet you. You know, I always offer. No one, they never take you up on that. Because all they want to do is show that my point is right. And it, you can't reason with someone who doesn't want truth. All you can do is just say, well, here's the truth. And let the Holy Spirit use those seeds. You know, you plant it or water. But it's just hard to reason with someone that's not. Now, if they're looking for truth, you'll be able to reason with them. If they want it. Um, but if, and that's where you just got to discern, let the Holy Spirit lead you. Whether someone's being... That's the, that's the proverb that always throws people off about rebuke, not a scorner. But then it says, rebuke a scorner in the next verse, right? <laughs> the back-to-back -back verses, and people are like, it's contradictory. No, there's some people that you gotta, they're, you'll be able to talk to, and they're listening, and some people that won't, and you don't waste your time, because they don't want truth. And that's why there's proverbs are back-to-back -back like that. So They seem contradictory, but they're not. You just have to discern who you're speaking to, mm -hmm. and what, what they're looking for. Anything else? Johnny, do you have something? I'm just changing one. Cool. All right. Um, true concepts of God. All right. Th those are false. Let's talk true. The intuitive of the first truth leads us to a true concept of God in three steps. All right. Um, there's theism. All right. Theism is the belief in a personal, infinite God. Um, and all, all of us, I, I, you agree with all three of these statements. Right? And all I'm doing is just building our correct thinking on God. But theism is a, the belief in a personal, infinite God. This eliminates atheism, agnosticism. It doesn't eliminate polytheism. We will before these next three points are up. But theism believes this. There is a God. He's always been. And he wants to have a relationship with me. He is touched by my feelings. He knows what's going on in my life. He hears me when I pray. He wants to talk to me. Right? As a proper look, that's theism. Then we build on that and we say monotheism. Now we're going to add to the theism and say monotheism. Monotheism is the belief in only one personal infinite God. So now we've done away with the polytheistic, right? Now we're mono, we say there's one God. All right? There's only one God. And this one God is personal, infinite, and he wants to have a relationship with me, and there's one God. Now, we've not quite got all the way we should be because the Jews believe that. And they're not saved. The, the Muslims believe that. But they're not saved. Unitarians believe that. But they're not saved. Right? It's just one God. Uh, so then we, we build on theism, monotheism, to where we get to triune monotheism. This is the belief that sees the biblical revelation of God, what the Bible teaches, that there's one God existing co-equally, co-eternally, and co-essentially as three persons. Yet one. Now we're going to barely touch on that, but my goal is in the fall... Because we will then study Jesus. We've already studied the Holy Spirit, all right, um, in our institute classes. So I'm trying to put all these together to where we can, we'll then talk about the Trinity in detail to the best we can. I've never heard anyone just do, you know, well, that makes it simple, right? It's, it's kind of beyond our minds, right? We have all kinds of illustrations we can apply, which helps us. But we believe in one God that he personal relationship that he exists co-equally, co-eternal, and co-essentially as three persons, yet one. Uh, definitions of God, and I put that in quotation marks because the fact is this, God cannot be defined. Right? You can't define God. Uh, Webster's Dictionary has done a, 
a, a noble intent. Uh, but you, you can't. Our God is above definition. He is incomprehensible. He is eternally and infinitely above the intellect of man. We can't wrap our mind around God. And I'll just get you going on that because as far as I need to go, God had no beginning. Go let figure that out. He had no beginning. Our minds can't comprehend it because everything has a beginning because we're so, we're time-based, right? But God has no beginning. He's beyond our thoughts. We, we can't even begin to describe that. And so, you know, I can't let's sit down next to someone and be like, you know, God has always been. Oh, yeah, how's that? I have no idea. Because <laughs> he's God, right? He has always been. Uh, some scriptural designations of what God is. Again, got the references here. We're not going to turn to all these, right? But uh, write them down if, you, if, you, if you're writing these things down. But number one, God is a spirit. It's in John chapter 4, verse number 24. God is a spirit. Now, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm just saying what the Bible says about God himself. How the scriptures have designated what God is. God is a spirit. John 4, verse 24. That's his essence. God is light, 1 John 1, 5. That is his holiness. He is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. That's his character. He is love. According to Hebrews 12 and verse 29, God, our God is a consuming fire. That is his justice. Now these are just pure scriptural, I'm not building a lot on it, I'm just telling you what the Bible says, right? The Bible says God is a spirit. God is light, God is love, and God, our God is a consuming fire. That shows his essence. God is not... Um, you, you, everyone's seen the comics with God sitting on a throne with a big white beard, right? It's not true. Okay. Right? He's a spirit. It just isn't true. And so, don't get caught in semantics here and say, well, will we see God when we get to heaven? Yes, we will see the Lord. And Jesus said these words, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. They say, that's kind of getting, I know, that's why God's behind, beyond our description, right? But I, God is a spirit. And we're, and we're just studying God right now. God is a spirit. That's his essence. God is light. He is completely holy. God is love. That is his character. That's, that's what God does. He loves. Yet God is a consuming fire. He has to be completely just. And he is completely just. So those are the scriptural designations of what God is. Theologians, just some quotes that man has made that, I, that are pretty good, right? Um, a. H. Strong, who was a Baptist, he said this, God is the infinite and perfect spirit in whom all things have their source, support, and end. That's a pretty simple thing, but that is pretty powerful too, right? God is an infinite and perfect spirit in whom all things have their source, support, and end. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, the one Baptist, right? Uh, but some good men said this, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't look at those two sins and be like, well, now we know God. I mean, just, it's beyond our thoughts. But it, these things, between what the Bible says, and there's all kinds of other good quotes, but these are good ones, that we can kind of wrap our mind around what the, what the Bible's telling us about God. But remember that, his essence, his holiness, his character, and his justice, he's a spirit, he's light, he's love, and a consuming fire. Those are the things the Bible directly says about God, right? Um, how would you define God? So I gave you some notes and I gave you a couple of quotes, but how would you define God? If someone came up to you right now and said, define God. They don't know it. They don't know what you know. They don't. They've not been in church. What would you say? They want to try. There's no wrong answer to this year. Totally wrong. I have a little chart that I I didn't do it. I found it. I thought it was pretty good though. I 
God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Spirit, but the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Father is not the Son, but they are. And that's just kind of one of those things your mind's just like, whoa. Right? Mm -hmm. But it's true, right? How would you define God? Any thoughts? Hmm. I'd have to start with personal experience based on obviously scripture, but I, I mean I can personally testify that God is peace and God is my shepherd and you could add testimony to all of that, of course, and it, you can't put it all in a nutshell but I know these things because I've experienced him in this way not just an intellectual understanding though that's important it is but yes. but that so for me my most powerful tool shall we say in interacting with someone else is the personal testimony of what God has done in my life because I can speak to that as real I didn't answer the question no, it, to an extent, but it does, <coughs> and and it, it's it's and that's what <coughs> I forget which one to be asking. That is about the price, but that's where that re building relationships with people because they need to, they have to watch your life. They have mm -hmm. that's that's the most powerful thing because they see it. They see it in your life. They see how real it is, and um, you know that's why I try every morning in school. And this year I've been 100 percent successful, right? But every morning in school, I, I give a devotion in our homeroom class. And, and I told the class, and every morning I get up and say, I read this this morning, and here's what God showed me. And I'm not bragging, I'm not trying to people, anybody to pat me on the back. I want these children to see that God speaks to you. Mm -hmm. If you're listening and you're looking, God will show you. He'll reveal himself to you. And it's just observation and it's a powerful thing when they can see it. And I want them to see it. And not just in that, but in your whole life. That's why all these other things. But any other thoughts how we define God? You can bake on it more until me next week. Right? That'd be great, so. uh, still with this, I'm going to change colors in the slides later so you can run another major point. Yes? So, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, does that mean each of them are not God completely? Or are they... They are God completely. But they're not each other. But they're not each other. I wish I could tell you a lot more. And that's, <laughs> that's the Trinity. Yeah. Um, they are. They are. They're God. It's beyond our comprehension. I don't know. People have given illustrations like eggs and stuff like that to the three parts, but that's not a fully great explanation. It's just not. You know, where does, where does, the Lord said, when you see me, you've seen the Father. Absolutely true statement. Where does one end and the other start? Couldn't even begin to tell you. I, I can't. No one can. Um, that's where that really important word comes in. Faith. That's what the Bible says. And, um, there are, the, God is God. And there is an authority. There is authority there. Um, the Father is the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one is not more powerful than the other. One is not more wise than the other. That's an authority that Paul specifically said in the scriptures that the head of the Lord Jesus is God. And um, that's why the Lord said repeatedly, not my will, but thine. I'm going to build on this. So maybe try to explain some things here in the next few slides, right? Because that is, that is, it's hard to grasp, you know, but the, that is God. Uh, let's try it. Let's try to build on this. The Bible never argues for God's existence. Rather, it just begins by stating that He is and what has and what He's done. From our very first introduction to Him in Genesis, we learn that He is omnipotent, all-powerful, he is omniscient, all-knowing, and that he existed before all things that we know. Again, Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says what? In the beginning, what? God, God created. created the heaven and the earth. So again, I'm not going to read the first paragraph again. Look at that in light of Genesis 1. 
We later learn that he not only pre-existed his creation, but that he, in fact, is eternal, having no beginning and no ending. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He is eternal, he is everlasting, he has no beginning, and he'll have no end. There are many other attributes of God that we learn as we read through the Bible, and this is not exclusively a study on that, but it is important to understand that God has revealed himself to us. It's really important to get this, all right? And this is, you know, it doesn't answer your question, but this little statement right here is really important, all right? God wants us to know him. And God is going to give us everything we need to know him. And he wants to reveal himself. He said, when will I fully grasp this? When we get to heaven. And I, I mentioned this Sunday, or one Sunday. But when we get to heaven, we'll finally be, and after the rapture, we'll finally be when we, in the image of God, will be body, soul, spirit, all in perfection, all in able to worship the Lord in complete harmony. Then, you'll be able to look at me and tell me the answer to this. Um, because us in the image of God will be in full, right now, we're a mess. Because right now, my spirit wants to do right. Right now, my flesh wants to do wrong. Right now, my soul is going to make a decision on which one I'm going to follow, basically by which one I'm going to feed the most. If I feed my flesh and look at carnal things and think about wicked things or just worldly things, my flesh is going to be in control. Someday, all three are going to be in perfect harmony Perfect, holy, righteous, no more sin, perfection. Right now this battle is going on. That's what Paul's talking about when he says, in my spirit, I want to do this. But in my flesh, they said, what I know I should do, I shouldn't do. And what I shouldn't do, that I do. And he has this whole chapter talking about this, this con conflict that's going on between his, his spirit and his flesh. And, um, and it's real. It, it's constant. Uh, it's a bit of a strange idea because as the creator, he is not bound to do this. God wants to reveal himself to us. And I want you to get this. God was not bound to reveal himself to us. He doesn't owe us anything. Mm -hmm. It's because he reveals himself to us that we can surmise a very great truth. God wants us to know him. God didn't have to put anything in the Bible for us. God didn't have to put anything about him. He could have left it the in the beginning God. But there's so much scripture that he reveals himself to us. The many names that he goes by, the, 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 the way that he acts, the way that he handles situations, the, the spirit that he has, and, the, and, and, the, and, and all these things is so that we can know him. And that is, it should establish a great foundational truth in our life. God wants us to know him. That's why he's given us all these things, right? He wants to reveal himself to us. In the first three verses of the Bible, we learn that God not only exists, but that he is the creator. Now, this is kind of one of those things you have to think, all right? Um, I always tell the kids in high school, if you're, if you're daydreaming, you're going to have no clue here in five minutes, right? So focus on this, all right? In the first three verses of the Bible, we learn that God not only exists, but that he is the creator. And more than that, we learn that God is more than just one word. The words of Genesis 1 show us that God is more than what we might think. He is able to create, and yet he's able in his spirit, in, in his spirit move. Then we see that he is able to speak. So just in the first three verses of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heaven... And the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. So in these first few verses, he creates, he moves, and he speaks. God, at the very beginning of this book, is revealing himself to us. He wants us to see who he is. God said, all right, those are powerful words. Because John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Comparing Scripture with Scripture, we know that the phrase God said 
is the Lord Jesus Christ. When it says there, and God said in verse number 3 of Genesis 1, let there be light. And we know from John 1 that that's the Lord speaking. So we see the pre-incarnate Christ in verse 3, the Spirit of God in verse number 2, and the Father in verse number 1, as the Word was with God. We are introduced to the plurality of the existence of God right away in the Scriptures. And this is furthered in the verses right below it. So God is revealing himself to us, and we're not going to be studying, you know, we've already studied the Holy Spirit, we, we are going to look at Jesus in the fall, right? Uh, but you see these things in Genesis 1, verse 26 and verse 27, um, and you've all heard this before in preaching and teaching, but it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. The us, us that is certainly an acknowledgement of God, that God is more than just a singular force. I still can't just answer your question. But even in the scriptures, as God is beginning to reveal himself to us, this is page one, first verses. God is saying, look, I'm, a, I'm, a, I, I am moving, I have power, I, I, I speak. That, that automatically goes against everything that the agnostics believe and the, and, and, uh, and, uh, the, the deists believe, right? And he, he's, he's interacting. It doesn't take you long where he's walking with man and talking with man, right? There's a personal connection there. We always just look at the story about creation and the Garden of Eden, but also just don't lose fact that God is revealing himself in these first pages. This is who I am. And he's, he's doing all of these things. That us implies that he's an us. Uh, personhood. He refers to himself as a person all throughout the Bible. God has names, many of them. Uh, that he goes by in direct relationship to certain individuals to express some aspect of his nature. A lot of times he'll reveal himself as a different name to different characters. Um, to remember when he spoke to Moses, and Moses said, who do I say sent me? And the response to Moses was, I am. I am. All right? <clears throat> and uh, that had so many reasons, which I don't have time to talk about. All right? Uh, but, uh, but three, just, uh, the, again, uh, where are they? Some aspect of his nature, but three distinctly to express that he is a trinity as shown in Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So these three right here show who God is. He is one God eternally existing in three persons. God expresses the attributes of personality that we expect to see in anyone we encounter. God expresses thought, emotion, and volition. Again, what, what, what am I saying there? That's what makes us human beings. That's what makes us a being. And we were created in the image of God. Now, when I say that God has these same three things, I'm not saying he's, be he's become like us. We are in his image. Right? We are reflecting him. And the fact that we can think, we have emotions, and we have a will. And we're going to act on these three things. And you're going to see this on my next slide. All right? How all three... God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, throughout the Scripture showed all three of these things. They are God themselves, but they're one. Something amazing is that this is not expressed in just in His oneness, but in each of the persons of the Godhead. The Father, Son, and Spirit are more than just parts of God. They are the persons of God. Each expresses the attributes of a person independently. Again, I know it's really small. If you can read it, if not, I'll say it, right? But the Father, where, and this is not an exhaustive list, just an illustration of each. The Father, he showed thought. Uh, Matthew 6, 8, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask of him. So our God the Father knows what we have need of. He's able to look at us, think, and knows. Emotions, the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands. Love is an emotion. Volition for whatsoever, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. All right? So he has a will. The Son, he showed thought. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So he used thought, emotions, and when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of the hearts, he saith unto man. So anger and grief. You see his volition when he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Uh, you see, the Spirit of God shows thought 
And he, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit has his own thought. The Holy Spirit has his own emotions. And grieve not the Holy Spirit, or if I were, if I were sealed until the day of redemption. The Spirit of God has volition or will. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. The Spirit of God said, no, this is where you need to go. Uh, so, you see in all three, are they distinct? Yes, but all three show um, what we would recognize as being, you know, I, I look at, you know, Matthew, and Matthew has thought, emotions, and a will. Right? That's what makes him. Uh, who he is. And the decisions and the path that he takes. And you see all of these, I'm going to summarize this and I'll go on. Further, the Bible speaks of God's senses. He sees in Exodus 3.7. He hears in Exodus 3.7. He touches in Jeremiah 1.9. He smells in Genesis 8.21. He tastes in Matthew 27.34. Comprehending that God is more than just a force, more than it and it, is very important. We have a personal God, and we are created in His image. Three words that are more powerful than we can even imagine is just this phrase, He is alive. He implies a personhood. He's a he is represents his I am existence, and alive shows his present condition. That's why he referred to himself as he is the I am, the eternal living God. Life was no accident. It was created by the one who possesses life himself. He is life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. God is life. He is everything. Um, it's just a fascinating thing um, and it's almost impossible to wrap our mind around who God is but yet at the same time I say that with great hesitancy because God has revealed everything we need to know about him and you can have a personal relationship with him um, I read this this week don't build your faith on it all right? I just thought it was extremely interesting right? just extremely interesting and uh, I haven't even fully comprehended it yet right so I'm still trying to digest what I read. Uh, but um, someone shared this article that I read that um, you know the Jewish name for God is Yahweh, right? Mm -hmm. And they have no vowels in the name of Yahweh. So it's Y-H-W-H, -H, right? Because there's no vowels in the Hebrew language. And the pronunciation, this is what blew my mind, and I've just been thinking about it for two days now. The pronunciation of that is you breathing. When you inhale, you make the sound YH. And when you exhale, it's that WH. Now you all want to try this, so go ahead, right? You're like, mm. wow. No, I'm not saying. I'm just, I've just been thinking on that, and I can't find a flaw in that thinking. But that's, <laughs> he is life. And that's why the Bible talks, and I think one of the things that was brought out in this article was that his name was on all of our lips. And people want to deny it, but every time you breathe, hmm. listen to the when there's no more sound and you're laying in your room by yourself, maybe, you know, you hear someone else who already went to sleep, listen. It's something to think about, hmm. number one, because that's hmm. just one of those things. I may change my mind later, but I thought that was pretty cool, right? Um, but anyways, think on that. What do I got? I got six minutes. Ready? Here we go. The existence of God. We go really quick. Although the now we've talked about that's the concept, just laid foundation. All these different thoughts. The existence of God. Although the existence of God is a first truth, such a prime concept must be established and developed. There are three areas in which the intuitive knowledge of God can be developed. All right. So now we're just we're so. What I'm trying to say is we laid. The idea and the concept of God is this. There's nothing to prove it. The Bible doesn't ever even, even touch that. He is. All right, so now how do we build on that? And what we don't realize is everything I'm about to talk about, we've done. We didn't think about it, but we've done it. That's why the Bible says the scriptures were able to make us wise into salvation. Over time, we build on these things and it became real to us. All right? um, because at five years old, if you just said, Travis, is there a God? I would say, yes. But I had no relationship with him. I had to build on that concept to discover who God is. 
Uh, but number one, by reason, that which establishes the existence of God, reason, hopefully we're all past all three of these steps, but just keep this in mind when you're talking to people and you're trying to, these three things we're going to need to come. By reason, which establishes the existence of God, revelation, which develops the existence of God, and in reality, which confirms the existence of God. Even in this room, we've already talked about all three. Reason is that first truth. God put it in you. Revelation is what we learned. Right? Reality is what Tyler has experienced. Those three things has caused us to learn who God is. Right? We were born with it. The Bible tells us about it. And the reality of living it and hearing from God and talking to God becomes real in our lives. The existence of God established by reason. The arguments from reason do not prove that God is, but they support the first truth that God is. It may be shown, but not proved. There are eight arguments from reason which establish our intuitive belief that God exists. I am going to get to these really quick, so just read with me. First of it is the argument of universal belief. I've already talked about this some, so I have to go back on it. Everywhere you go, no matter where you go, everyone has this concept of God. They have a God consciousness in them. The fact that this is universal supports the concept of a universal cause. If one man or tribe had this knowledge, it would mean little. But the fact that everybody, everywhere, no matter where you go, has this knowledge of God is factual. It changes everything, right? Uh, but the argument of universal belief. Then there's the argument of cause and effect. We've already kind of already talked about this too. This is sometimes referred to as the cosmological argument for the existence of God. It's an acceptance of a principle that everything has to have a cause. Things don't just happen, right? As we look around the world and see its beauties and wonders, reason brings us to the conclusion there has to be a cause. Um, reveals intelligence. Man is intelligent. Therefore, his cause, or his creator, must be intelligent. Creation is orderly. Therefore, the creator must be orderly. And he is. God's not the author of confusion. Uh, he re uh, reveals, the cause and effect reveals personality. You have a personality. Your creator has to be personal. Right? You are created with this personality. It reveals power. We see great power in many aspects of creation. That power must have had a cause that is powerful. All energy must have an energizer. Right? There's, there's, a, there's a power behind all these things. The argument of design. A clock requires not only a maker, but a designer and a purpose. I read that in my devotions in Jeremiah chapter number 50 this morning, uh, where Jeremiah is rebuking Israel and saying that, uh, that God created you. With all wisdom and understanding. He created you. He designed you with a purpose and knew what he was doing. In creation, we see design and purpose everywhere. Everything has a purpose. I mean, I don't, just take the human body. All right? Every part of your body has a purpose. And even if a scientist hadn't figured it out yet, there's a purpose. All right? Because God, he created everything and everyone with a purpose and with a design. The argument from life, man cannot make life. Scientists can observe it. They can even engineer genes, but they can't create life. Life comes from outside of man or nature. The art, you say, well, they clone. Yet they take already DNA that's already life, right? They're not creating life. Uh, the argument from being, man's intuition of God, no matter where on earth, is of an infinite perfect being. I don't want to just say this. Right? All these gods that everyone has created, they all share one thing in common. They're powerful, and they're in charge, right? And they are perfect, no matter what their god is. And that, that, that argument from being, right? Where did that come from? God made them with this knowledge, right? God made them with this. Man would not have devised such a God if there were no existence of such a God. The argument from morality, man is moral, mental, and emotional being as his creator could be no less. That's where our thoughts, emotions, and volitions come from that we talked about. The argument from congruity, if the old saying goes that the key fits the lock, you have the right key. If the theory fits the facts, you have the right theory. Belief in a self-existent personal God is in harmony with all the facts in every aspect of life. Take even creation. Right? There's evolution and there's creation. Our theory 
It works perfect with the world. It works perfect. Now, people say, I don't believe it. Okay. But my, our theory of what we believe the Bible teaches fits fine with what we see and observe today in every aspect. That's what you see. You know, I don't care if you're digging up fossils in the Grand Canyon or you're studying a rose or whatever you're doing, my theory lines up right with it. I have no problem with that. A, a, a lost world doesn't want to see it. That's why when Bill and I and Ken Ham had their debate, every Christian was just like, boy, Ken Ham just killed him. And every lost person was saying, Bill and I swept them, right? And why? Because you already decided what you believe. And you knew what you were looking for. But my and I but I do believe obviously Ken Ham's right, but our beliefs and what we believe lines up with what is observed. Uh, the argument from history. History is but the record, Oliver Cromwell said. Um, history is but the record of God trampling beneath his feet those who work in opposition to his purpose. I just thought that's a cool statement. Uh, but history is truly his story, and in the rise and fall of nations we see the hand of God. There's been when you look back at history, that's why I have that picture here pieces all fit perfectly. I mean, you, you read Daniel, what has been, what's going, what is, and what's going to be, perfect. And you look at the world and where we're heading and what we're doing, perfect. The existence of God developed by revelation. Reason, revelation. Revelation, scripture does not attempt to prove the existence of God, it assumes it. The Bible asserts the existence of God and declares the fact of universal intuition. That first truth, as we already read in Romans chapter 1. Where reason will help establish the innate intuition, the Bible develops it and reveals God to us. That's the main foundation of this class, is that we're going to take the Bible and develop now what the Bible says about what, who God is. This is. We are going to look at the revelation part. We'll talk some about the reality of how God's affected our lives. But tonight's purpose was to show us... Right, I don't have to go back and prove there is a God. The Bible says there is a God. And that's where it all begins. And that's what tonight's been all about. It's the main foundation. And then thirdly, the existence of God confirmed by reality. Brother Tyler mentioned he would describe God as the peace that he has and all answer prayers and things. Millions of people have experienced the reality of God in their own lives. Far too many for real to say there is no God. God is not a fad. Mm -hmm. if he is it's the longest running fad it's ever been because it's been from day one things come and go God has been consistent you look at salvation you look at changed lives answer prayers, miracles wisdom, guidance all confirm what the Bible has said the reality we're going to build on these things this is the last slide and if you're taking this class for training purposes, take a picture of this slide. All right. Uh, but next week you'll have a test over the notes that we did today. You'll need to know Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. And do on January the 25th. I need a 500 to 750 word paper on one of the following topics. First I'll say, please note, the paper is due on January 25th. Last time two people turned it in the next, the next week. Right? So you've got a few weeks. Right? <laughs> and you can choose one of these topics. All right, things God cannot do, which I always say, we always just say God can't lie. Just, there's, there's a couple things, there's a couple things, instead of that. Uh, or what does it mean for God to repent? It's in the Bible a lot. So, what's it mean? Uh, the names of God, if you want to study some of the different names of God that he goes by, or you can write your paper on Colossians 2.9. If you're interested in that, you read it. Right? All right. Not too bad. Five minutes. That's not too bad at all. Any questions? I know you always want to go. Any questions? On that? I know I go quick. Yeah, I have any questions. All right, John. So, um, if God wants us to know Him, how come no one can define Him? Do you know? Him? No. Huh? Yes. You did a pretty good job. There. It's in, in the same way, I would look at you and say this. Do you love Jenna? I know I'm going to this spot. Do you love Jenna? Describe love. Define it. You, got, you're, you can talk a lot. 
do we really can grab the concept of that fully? And love's pretty simple compared to God. But, but you know it. You know it. I know it. And I know, I know him. And he's revealed himself to me. Can I define him? I know I'm married. I know that. Can I define the moment and then I got married? I cannot. I know a lot of people that have a lot of different things about that. But I know I'm married. What is marriage? That would be a month's lessons. It's just knowing God is something you do. It's hard to describe. And uh, to, to do it justice might be the phrase to add here. So to do it justice. So that's a good question, but that would be my answer. Else. Come back next week. We're going to build on this. Right? So let's pray. God, thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for the time to study you. And uh, I do pray that, Lord, we just see you more and more and understand you through your word, even more than what we do. And Father, we love you. Just watch over us. Dismiss us now. And Lord, we just uh, give you the praise for it all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.